All right, hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. We're here with a very special guest that is a friend of Ken's. Ken, why don't you jump us off and uh, give us an intro? All right, well, I'm really delighted to have uh, my friend Ken Williams on the show. And by the way, um, it's easy to remember because we got a pair of Kens on this call, Ken talking to Ken. Um, so <laughs> anyway, Ken is a pastor in Redding, California with uh, Bethel Church, but He's not just a local staff pastor. He's had that role as well in the past. Um, he he kind of plays on a bigger stage and uh, is very actively involved in, shall we say, the field of identity politics. And uh, we'll unpack that as we go through the podcast. But um, I'm just really excited to have Ken on the show. Uh, some of you will remember Elizabeth Woning, who was on last week. And Ken and Elizabeth uh, often work together. And when I go to Reading, I, I typically have time and make time uh, to have a meal with the two of them. And sometimes those meals go quite long because of the uh, just a wonderful interaction that we have between the three of us. And just an early heads up to everybody in 2024, we are going to be doing um, a conference that where both Ken and Elizabeth will be speakers. I'll be a speaker. Um, so will Andy Kamiski, who's also been on this show. And we have a couple of others that are pending. I can't announce them yet because they haven't said yes, but I think they're going to. It's going to be a dynamic conference. You'll want to be there and no details yet. Just be on the lookout and we'll let you know in plenty of time to get registered. So Ken, welcome to the show. Hey, it's a privilege. Any chance to get to hang out with you, Ken? I'm there. <laughs> All right. Well, here we are hanging out virtually since we can't do it uh, <laughs> at one of the coffee shops in Reading. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Ken, our, many of our listeners don't know you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your own story of how you came to faith, met Jesus, and uh, you know, got, got going as a Christian? Yeah, okay. I was raised in the South. I grew up in Texas mostly. Um, in the Bible Belt, and we went to, we were conservative Christians, I guess you would say. I, so I was in church from the time I was born, pretty much, uh, several times a week. And so de developed an understanding of who God was and what his laws were and all of that. And so got saved at eight years old, a very, a very uh, heartfelt conversion experience. I remember sobbing a short time after getting saved having watched a Jesus film and seeing, you know, in cinematically what Jesus had done to pay for my sins. And I was undone by that. Um, and yet uh, didn't really feel like I knew what I could do in order to be closer to Jesus. I, it was, as, I had a very perfect perfectionistic approach to following Jesus. I was trying to just do all of the right things and I would say most of the Christians around me couldn't have told you much about what it was like to walk with God or to have a relationship with God, even though that's what we said. I don't know that many people around me knew what that meant. And so when I discovered in my early teens that I had same-sex attraction, um, that was really disturbing because I already was pursuing the Lord as much as I knew how. And uh, that was that was devastating because I knew what the Bible said about homosexuality. And matter of fact, I think the translations of the Bible that I was reading, it would just say homosexuals. So, you know, in Second Corinthians, I'm jumping right into it, Ken. But, you know, in Second Corinthians, the list of these different people that don't inherit the kingdom of God, homosexuals is right there in my Bible. And I realize, well, wait a minute, someone who is sexually attracted to others of the same sex. Isn't that what a homosexual is? And then the panic all by myself as about a 14 or 15 year old realizing, oh my gosh, even God hates me or maybe wants to send me to hell. And I don't have anything, you know, I didn't ask for these desires. I never got into a line and said, could I be different than the other boys? I just found myself this way. And so now what do I do about it? Like that's, that's kind of how, so, you know, the heart for God, but feeling like a total failure and matter of fact, he must hate me is kind of how I started out in my faith, Ken. Now, a lot of people who have those sorts of feelings um, handle them by 
rejecting Christianity, um, and I might add, given the environment you grew up in, probably the entirety of the cultural milieu of Texas that that you knew. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, uh, you know, people make jokes about it, but you know, they buy a one way ticket to San Francisco, West Hollywood, New York, mm-hmm. or Miami, and uh, they're never heard from again. So, <laughs> how did you handle these feelings? I mean, it's one thing to have the feelings, but what did you what did you do with that? Did you did you go through a period of unbelief or doubt or walked away from the Lord, or did you kind of stick in there and do mm-hmm. your best to stay with it, or how did you process that? I think I had the benefit of the times I, that I lived in for one thing, like it, you know, this was, I'm 51. So, you know, this is the eighties when I'm realizing, Oh, I'm coming of age and I'm not like the others. And it, you know, there was no scenario out there in, in mainstream culture to where being gay was accepted or celebrated like there is today. So I didn't have culture pushing me in a direction of embracing gay but at the same time you know that that genuine heart for god that got sparked when i was eight um i could never find any kind of peaceful way forward in my mind by just embracing homosexuality i mean the the you know the experiences i had had um by the time i was 13 14 15 that were homosexual uh were not though there might have been a moment of thrill i had no peace about it so i mean i was i was exposed to hardcore gay pornography as an eight-year-old and then that catalyzed the boys who saw that who introduced me to that to do some sex play and and extreme you know amounts of guilt and shame over that um that weren't worth any moment of of thrill was paying way too big of a price and then some interactions I had with a couple other boys kind of through my early teens that I didn't intend to get sexualized, but there was an advance made. And then it's like, oh, I, I, I feel validated by another male. And that's not something I'm used to. And, you know, but, but there again, there's this moment of a thrill and then deep shame, self-hatred, um, not feeling like I'm close to the Lord after that, you know, um, that, that was kind of what all was going on. So uh, there wasn't a point for me, Ken, um, where I thought, ah, I'll just go my own way. I, 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 I had actually, I didn't have enough. I didn't know how to make it emotionally moment to moment, even doing what I was doing and to have done more of it would have been too painful. Yeah, I I could easily see that. And, you know, anybody who has been down that pathway uh, describes those feelings of struggle, alienation. And, of course, um, many people want to blame feelings of wrongdoing or guilt on the church or maybe religion more broadly. But I, I think the better way to think about it is God has a right and a wrong way to do things. He's articulated those in his book called the Bible. And so Mm -hmm. what you were having was the interplay of your own conscience against the righteousness of God. 100%. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's easy. And uh, somehow you had to get through it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you did that? I mean, at one point you say on your own website, um, you fell into despair and, be, you know, had suicidal ideation. Uh, so mm-hmm. you were contemplating suicide. You mm-hmm. descended into despair, but you ultimately encountered the Lord and this changed everything for you. Tell us about that, because that's a, that's a pretty radical turning point And you don't hear a lot of people talking about that kind of a turn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think one of my fears was, you know, would this God that I had learned about and was pledging allegiance to come through for me? What would he really be real when it counted? And a lot of my Christian experience didn't seem to indicate that he would, even though I knew in theory he was supposed to. Um, but I kept going because I didn't have another option. And then when, like, uh, as you referred to when I was 17 is when I was suicidal, I was looking actively for ways to end my life. 
not because I wanted to kill myself, but because I didn't want to live another day in the pain that I was in and didn't know another way around. Um, but fortunately, um, I, 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 in my, I, I realized that I couldn't come up with a way to end my life that wouldn't destroy my family. Uh, and, and I didn't want to see that happen. And so I wrote out nine pages of my pain, anger, vulgarity. I just kind of vomited, sorry, onto those nine pages, uh, handed it to my youth pastor. My youth pastor uh, said, well, we're going to tell your parents. And I said, nope, you know, we're, we're not going to do that. And he said, oh, we are. And he knew my parents and he knew they would, they would love me and, and receive me. And uh, cried with them for two hours that night together as I shared with them this pain that I'd been dealing with on an hourly basis, living under their roof that they had no idea about. They knew I was tended to be kind of depressed and see the negative and, and those types of things, but they didn't know why. And um, so I, I started seeing a Christian psychologist, um, which was extremely important because he kept me alive. He, he gave me enough hope to realize, hey, you know, one of the, it's so funny because there's the argument today that, well, you know, therapists mistreat, you know, this people like me or they force them down a certain path uh, or, 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 or holding these uh, Christian standards against, you know, me. Uh, what I experienced was um, a, a loving older man authority figure that that i could say all my sin all my whatever and he would he would bring me in front of a, a god who had paid for those sins he, you know he 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 spent the whole first couple of years with me just saying ken he said you would not know grace if it hit you in the face you know and and that was true i did not have i was just working for love from god and and so he he worked with me to help me understand wait a minute God sets standards for us, but he also is the one who empowers us to be able to meet those standards. Um, I wasn't going to have to just strive every minute trying to be enough for God. Like God was going to help me with even that. Right. And, and so, you know, this was a completely different lens of living the Christian life than I had grown up with. And, and so I, I, I started moving that direction. And unfortunately, that took me into, okay, well, I'll just, you know, God has grace for my sin. So I'll start drinking and I'll drink too much, you know. And so at this one point, I, I drank five beers in 20 minutes in my fraternity in college, passed out. You know, the next morning I wake up, my, my whole... Uh, gastrointestinal system is just pretty wrecked. And, um, and so I was, I, I developed an illness, a, a whole stomach illness, a bunch of allergies, everything that started there that lasted for five years, tried everything, every medical approach, nu nutritional allergy, all, all these non-traditional even approaches, nothing would work. Um, and finally, then this friend of mine who I had been estranged from, had gotten really filled with the Holy Spirit and 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 really just following God wholeheartedly. And he called me and he said, Ken, how you doing? And I said, well, I'm really sick. You know, that thing I had in college is worse. And he said, well, Ken, God doesn't want you to be sick. And I said, what? <laughs> you know, I, I had never, I had never heard a Christian tell me something like that before. Yeah. And he said, Ken, God loves you and he has a plan for your life. He doesn't want you to be sick. Jesus paid for your healing. And, and so we got together. He laid hands on me, prayed for me. I mean, I felt, can I had a knockdown drag out experience in my body? I had, I felt things moving in my abdomen. Uh, I, I, I felt the presence of chaos be ripped out of my body passed gas for five hours, almost continuously. Wow. And, and then I felt this peace that I hadn't had in, I don't know if I'd ever had that. Yeah. And I was able to eat um, food. I, you know, I was allergic to almost every food you can think of. There were three foods I was not allergic to. And so, I, you know, my friend, Brian, he said, go eat something. And I said, well, I have these allergies. He goes, 
somebody got healed and it wasn't me. He said, God gave us the food. You know, he put the food on the earth for us to eat and he blessed it. Go eat. So I ate all this food I wasn't supposed to eat. And I did not feel it slide down my inflamed esophagus. Um, and and I I realized, oh my gosh, I've the Lord has healed me. I gained 25 pounds in a month because I was skin and bones and all that. But my takeaway, Kent, so I got my life back. I, I got my my ability to have a vitality of life. But my takeaway, my biggest takeaway was, oh my gosh, God is good. And I did not know that. Wow. And, and I thought, if he's good and he says that homosexuality is sin, then he must have a solution for it because he's not diabolical. He's good. And nobody, no, no authority figure gives a command of its creation that it cannot fulfill. But you got to say all that again. <laughs> that is so choice. And it's so contrary to the memes that are out there. Just say all that again. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's easy or without complication or having right. to really follow the Lord step by step. But no noble authority figure would have a created being and give it instructions or guidelines that it cannot fulfill. That would be diabolical. That's that, that goes against any kind of notion of being good. And so in having experienced that physical healing that I did not deserve. Because remember, I drank five beers in 20 minutes and passed out. Blatant sin. I knew that I was sinning. And I thought, oh my gosh, he forgave me and I didn't deserve it. So who minute, is so this? I thought the scripture said, be not drunk with wine, not be not drunk with beer. So maybe you got a technical <laughs> exception. <laughs> maybe that's what it was. You I know, don't really believe that, but that's the way some people think. <laughs> there is a loophole. You yeah. know, um, yeah, I mean, I was blown away by his goodness and i thought i just did the simple math right there and i thought if he if he's that good then if he said that homosexuality is sin he must have a solution for it he wouldn't say you cannot live this lifestyle it's sin if there's no way to not do that and so i just started a pilgrimage that day just trying to find out who is this person that i that i've been serving that i didn't know very well and what does he offer me Fantastic. Wow. What a story. So you got rescued and it sounds like delivered. You know, I, I, uh, most of our listeners know that I uh, do a fair amount of teaching on deliverance. And, um, uh, one of the things that I tell them, tell people is when evil spirits are leaving, there's a variety of ways they can leave. Um, and you know, burping, sneezing, coughing, but another one is flatulence. And, uh, yep. you know, there's a lot of nervous laughter around the room when, I say that, but you know, you just said for about five hours, it was almost continuous. Mm -hmm. So it sounds mm -hmm. like we might say everything was coming out the South end. <laughs> yes. I matter of fact, I felt my, you know, my stomach had been bloated for five years and right. I felt over that five hours, I felt it was as if water was slowly being drained out of a stopped sink. I felt this going into, and then when it was, when it was done, I could tell, I was like, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've often had people make that kind of comment after a round of a deliverance type prayer where they, they just mm -hmm. say, it's gone. I know it's gone. I feel completely different. And they are different. They, yeah. they just don't have that going mm -hmm. on longer. So I guess it's safe to say that, you know, not only biblically, but from your own experience, um, you believe that people definitely can get completely free of the LGBTQIA plus um syndrome complex mm -hmm. whatever we're going to call it but that mm -hmm. yeah i do i i do believe and I, and i think that the only way we would come up with something different is if we go off into human reason or or some kind of temporal thinking as opposed to looking strictly at scripture or knowing who god is or any of those things that we would come up with uh, this subcategory of life called LGBT, where, well, you can get mostly free, but you can't get all the way free. I think, too, there's like probably a, a thing or two that wars against that. I think the fact that culture has determined that identity breaks down into heterosexual or homosexual, transgender, queer, 
uh, asexual, and then all of the new identities that are being constructed um, day by day right now, then you, you're actually not able to come to the knowledge of the truth because you're looking, you're using rules that God doesn't, those aren't his guidelines. Th those aren't the way that he sees people. And so, you know, I, I, a lot of my freedom has come by throwing off the labels entirely and realizing that God has only ever seen me as a man. He, even when I was having some homosexual sexual behavior, he didn't see me as a gay man. He saw me as his son. Amen. And so, you know, so um, I don't have much, much same sex attraction anymore. I have whole whole seasons of time where I don't have any, you know, but if I have a moment of that ever, now I'm realizing, oh, okay, there's some lie I'm believing. There's some need that I'm having with regard to my identity where I've got a place of insecurity or something like that. Maybe I'm, 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 I'm a little lonely. I'm disconnected from, um, from other men who usually I gain strength from synergizing with them. There's, there's something going on, but most of the world doesn't have that lens to look through. And so if you get a moment of some kind of aberrant attraction, culture wants me to say, oh, that's who I am, as opposed to here's an anomaly. I wonder where that came from. You know, I think what you just described there is a pattern with uh, almost any kind of sin that somebody might be drawn to. Um, right. It, whether it's a whether it's a dominant thing in their life or it's something that's more transient, uh, you know, you might not be a drinker at all, but you have a bad day and you think, man, I'm just going to go out and get plastered. Maybe you've never right. even before. Or I'm thinking of one friend of mine who wasn't he'd never smoke uh, smoked a cigarette ever. Mm -hmm. And again, he was kind of having a bad day and he goes, that's it. And he just went out and bought a pack of cigarettes and started smoking, even though that wasn't who he was at all. And so I would say he's yeah temptation which can be right. exacerbated by just the struggles the hardships the difficulties of life it doesn't define who you are or it doesn't need to define who you are mm -hmm. if you let it again but um but this is the nature of of life in a fallen world martin luther famously said you can't stop the birds of the air from flying over your head but you can prevent them from making a nest in your hair yes yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. And unfortunately, we we have a culture now which celebrates building a nest in the hair. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. And, on, and on many levels, too, this isn't just about the mm -hmm. QIA question, although it certainly mm -hmm. is that. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. Um, when you think about people who are leaving that worldview and that lifestyle, um, as you did, you do a lot of ministry, you teach a lot of conferences, you travel heavily, uh, you know, all over the world dealing with people who are struggling with these things. Do you see some kind of a, I don't know, pattern or a common discernible footprint for people who are leaving or who are, you know, going through transformation? Is there something that mm -hmm. you could describe as kind of here's here's the template that I most commonly see? Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's a few things that I typically, you know, I've, I've seen, I've been at this for a long time. And so I've seen people have breakthrough and then it wane, you know, and then I've seen people move on into great levels of freedom and kind of the subject changes and they move on and have a family and it's really not their issue anymore. And, and so several things I see that are that are common. One is you, you have to be in an environment where you have regular exposure to the presence of the Lord. Now, the presence of the Lord is everywhere. And so but am I able to experience it? You know, do I know how to connect with the Lord? Do I know how to hear the Lord? And and really, it, it so many we need the support of others. So being in an environment to where I'm regularly going to have the kind of worship that I can really experience God in it and feel connected to him, that kind of thing. Um, also, inner healing and deliverance. You, you, I mean, it's just real rare that you see people that get free from this type of uh, an identity or a lifestyle um, that they don't have access to someone doing 
inner healing type prayer ministry with them, walking them through the pains of the past, the lies they've believed, that kind of thing, or just outright, you know, uh, breaking off access from, you know, evil spirits um, into their life. I mean, that that's just such an important piece. And then I think also, um, you know, having the, the discipleship uh, scenario around you to where you're actually replacing the lies you've believed with truth. So there's the moments of prayer ministry, but then an ability to leave there and, and to reinforce the truth that the Lord just showed me and, and walk that out. And the, I would say the fourth thing is really in the fellowship of others that are pursuing the Lord with me. You know, I needed spiritual moms, spiritual dads, particularly spiritual dads. I needed spiritual brothers. Um, and, and once I started to have that around me, I really was able to take these encounters with God that he'd given me and now start to walk differently because I wasn't doing it in isolation. I had, you know, one can put a thousand to flight, but two can put 10,000. And if you've got a, a, a band of brothers uh, or in a couple of spiritual dads walking with you, you can start to really be convinced that you are the new creation that Jesus made you into by his death and resurrection. But when I'm out there trying to do this life on my own, I have the encounter with God, but then I'm out there. It's just me trying to battle. I mean, the enemy doesn't, he doesn't go without a fight. And so he's going to come back and check that place where he had been and bring seven others to try to make your state worse. And so you need kind of the band of brothers or sisters around you hearing the Lord on your behalf. I mean, those, those words that, that I would get from these spiritual dads in particular, and they'd be like, hey, Ken, I've been, th-, you know, so I would come and say, well, I, I just horned out all weekend, you know, and he'd be like, well, it's just not who you are. You know, and he, he'd say, thanks for confessing it. Let's nail that to the cross, you know, and he'd be like, all right, so here's what the Lord's been telling me about you this week. So you still think that your identity is from this thing you did. Here's how he's been telling me that you are. And, and it would be stuff that was from the Lord and it would go in. And I would think, no, that I know he's right. I just need more time to walk it out. So I, that's that's a long answer, but that's kind of my take on it. Well, I think those are I think those are very good uh, indicia or uh, indicators uh, for people who are coming out of that kind of lifestyle, and maybe not just indicators that they're going to, but maybe even the kinds of things that they need to build into their own life to reinforce mm-hmm. um, the transformation that the Spirit of God has going on within them. And you know, some of these are. I mean, these are as old as Christian spirituality, the, the idea of living in community and having right. with whom we can speak honestly. We call it living in community. OK, fair enough. But it but there's a kind of, uh, you know, all cards are on the table and we know that we know we're going to be loved in the face of no matter what we may have fallen back into. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the power of shame here is gigantic. Because I think shame tells me that my identity is other than who I actually am. And and so, you know, uh, it's one thing to do the sin. It's another thing for me to walk away believing that that now indicates who I am again. And when I'm left to myself to battle that on my own, I don't win very often. And and so when, when you've got those right people that God puts in your life and you're giving yourself in relationship to them and listening to the Lord through them, you can really gain ground. But um, we don't always do that the best today. We've all got our we got our phones. You know, I can I can have my whole own little world just here all the time. And uh, but there's a the whole world out there. Relationships. This is a relational problem. This is an intimacy problem, in my opinion. And the enemy, the enemy capitalizes on it. And uh, so we need, we need the, we need to be having these encounters with the Lord directly. And then we need to be having encounters with people that, that he's put in our lives. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I love that. I love it. Well, it's part of why I enjoy being around you whenever, whenever we get together. Um, so, all right. You've been a pastor at Bethel for uh, well over what I'm just trying to think from what I know. 
you've been about you've been a Bethel pastor for about 10 years. Is that right? 17 years. 17. All right. So I was off by a factor of two almost. Um, <laughs> you've been at it for a long time. But in addition to pastoring there, you are also involved in three movements that you um, you know have on your uh, website. One is called Changed Movement. And I'm familiar with that one. And Moral Revolution, I'm familiar with. And then you have another one I actually didn't know, but I, I saw it when I looked up just kind of the latest and greatest on Ken uh, called Equip to Love. What is each of these three organizations and what makes it unique from the others? Mm -hmm. We we began as Equipped to Love, Elizabeth Wanning and I did. And, uh, and really, it was our heart to equip the church on how do you navigate LGBTQ? How do you help people? that are struggling in knowing who they are, or they're caught in a, in a, a life, you know, um, how do you actually walk with these people and, and bring, bring support, uh, rather than just criticism or whatever the other negative stuff is. Um, but no sooner did we really start pioneering that ministry than California tried to pass a bill that would have made our ministry largely illegal um, and next thing you know, Elizabeth and I are testifying in those government hearings on that bill in 2018. And in order to do that well, we realized they think it's just the two of us with this story. We, there's, there's many people around the world with our testimony. So we pulled together a book and called it Changed. Uh, you showed it to me at the know. coffee shop in Reading. Yeah. We yep. put that book together to show the, the legislators, hey, we're not the only ones with this story. Please don't take away. Our, we're not asking that you outlaw people's ability to live an LGBTQ lifestyle. Please don't outlaw, outlaw our ability to follow our faith convictions out of that lifestyle. And um, and so, you know, we, we rallied on the Capitol steps with those books and with shirts that said changed on the front. And that turned into a movement because it got picked up on social media and went viral. And, uh, and so then now we had this movement of, of all these people. We, we have a closed Facebook group with thousands of people in there that are also journeying deeper into Christ and out of an LGBT life. Um, and so now that's, we do advocacy, like we speak with with uh, through Changed, we, we speak to senators and Congress people the United Nations, uh, major think tanks uh, in, in government. We help with uh, different legislation behind, you know, uh, uh, in, in different states and in different countries, just any place where they're trying to take away freedom from people to self-determine their future and their identity. Uh, we, we help with language and things like that so that it's not just one side fighting the other, but it's a you know, we're able to have hopefully laws that advocate for freedom for everybody and uh, don't just pit one side against the other. So so that's changed is the movement of people, plus also um, speaking up in the public sector uh, for freedom. Um, and then Moral Revolution is the ministry that we're connected to that just it's out of Bethel Church as well. It's, it's a separate ministry than Bethel, but it's going after the morality in general. Uh, particularly trying to reach the younger generations, uh, making an appeal that, hey, God's way is the best way. And you actually, God's not ashamed to talk about sex. He created it. And, you know, we can partner with him and actually really live a fulfilled life by by following God's directives um, and keep everyone safe in the process. So amazing. So rich. I love it. Um we just need more of this. Uh, let me go back to something you said about three minutes ago. You said you've got okay. thousands of people in a closed Facebook group, and I can understand why you would want it to be closed. Um, being closed mm -hmm. tends to keep Facebook from censoring you uh, for, quote unquote, violating community standards. Mm -hmm. But it also lets you have more candid conversations among those who mm -hmm. essentially are self-selected to be in the group rather than coming in to uh, stir things up and throw brick bats verbally. Right. So, but you said you have thousands of people in the group. Um, the, the last numbers that I uh, saw, 
is that approximately 2.7% of the U.S. population um, has ever had any kind of a gay experience of any sort. And when I say gay, I'm kind of using that as the catch-all for, for anything that might be included. Yeah. Queer, bisexual, transgendered, whatever, intersex, go on with, with any of it. So we're talking less than 3% of the U.S. population. The population of the U.S. right now is about 335 million. And I'm aware, by the way, that, that there's much more to the world than the United States for all of our listeners, but I'm <laughs> help people gauge this. So there might be up to roughly uh, 10 million or so uh, homosexual or otherwise, um, you know, of this persuasion in the United States. I think many people would suppose that there were far, far, far more than that out there. And it is it is trending higher in the under 20 generation because of some of the societal changes we have going on. But mm -hmm. um, do, does that sort of a metric. And let me before I even ask the question, let me just say this. Two weeks ago, the Washington Post, which is no media of uh, right wing vitriol. Uh, did an article on transgenderism, and they said that in the U.S., 0.6% of the population uh, identifies as transgender. That works out to be just a little bit under 2 million people. And so we've got this incredible social revolution going on. The big bucket category is in the neighborhood of 10 million. The one that's the most provocative and controversial is just under 2 million. Does, does it ever come into the conversations when you're with legislators or others? I mean, you have many conversations, uh, as you said, including even at the UN, where the idea of, of uh, Mr. Spock from Star Trek comes up, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Not that we're trying mm -hmm. to oppress or suppress anybody, but how do we how do we manage a society for the greater good? Does that does that thinking ever come up anywhere? Yeah, can you say a little bit more about like what you're concerned is is happening? Well, I, I just think it's interesting that we have such a gigantic conversation going on. Mm -hmm. And we have a relatively small, very small part of the population mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. practicing this. And meanwhile, what I didn't say and should have, but I'll say it now. Uh, meanwhile, you've got a Facebook group that has thousands of people in it by your own admission. Mm -hmm. And so that mm -hmm. would be potentially a meaningful fraction of the overall community mm -hmm. of people who are part of this subpopulation group. And right. that strikes me as rather, well, it, it's, it's not what you would expect from listening to mainstream media or social media. Because you would think that 25% of the population is some form of LGBTQIA. And by the way, they're happily so, have no interest in leaving it. But what you're suggesting is you have a group that runs the, the, its very existence, um, mm -hmm. belies that sort of thinking, and says that a lot of people actually want out of this. Mm -hmm. It's very true. It's very, very common. Even even the people that we know that have chosen to go ahead and live an LGBT you know lifestyle with LGBT sex in there, there were there was a period at least early on that that's not what they were wanting, you know and and so, I mean Ken, some of this comes down sorry to the fact that you know the American Psychological Association abandoned the LGBTQ community under activist pressure starting 50 years ago. Hmm. So the ones who could have actually brought more help eventually under activist pressure caved, you know, and then you have things like, you know, the book after the ball that came out in the, in the early nineties, you know, which was psychology and marketing coming together to persuade the minds of Americans to accept or, affirm or endorse a, a, a gay lifestyle, well, was that what was best for each individual? Um, or was this made for other reasons? Was, was, were, you know, did that go forth because of the opinions of the masses or because of the opinions of the few? So, I mean, there are a lot of people out there that have not experienced yet 
God the way that I have and have not been able to find a pathway out, but they wanted a way out or they want a way out. And, and I think there's also probably um, places where the church, you know, um, didn't do what it could have done 40, 50 plus years ago, you know, and, and rather than realizing that these are people in need and people that are broken, you know, held up signs and declared what terrible people these are. I mean, culture was doing that, you know, it wasn't just the church, but, um, you know, wow, I, I, I really hope God gives us a redo here to where a message can go forth that the church is not the one who is casting dispersions on people with alternative lifestyles or what we would consider to be ungodly lifestyles. The church is the one who can connect any person in pain to a God who paid for the pain. And mm-hmm. <laughs> we've got to, we've got to change our messaging such that we're saying you're in pain, you're broken, you feel like you're ashamed or you're a sinner or or your lifestyle is not working for you, let me introduce you to a person who knows you, created you, and has a plan for your life. That's that's what we want to do. We're not trying to change any people's minds. We're trying to to advocate that, you know, whether you're whether you think you're addressing the masses or a small section of people, we need freedom for people to pursue their faith, pursue their conscience. And arrive at you and I just happen to have to know God personally. So we know that when someone does um, have space for a God that can do anything and that loves them uniquely, that path into righteousness, peace, and joy is available. That's so well said. I I'm trying to think how could I improve that? And I, I can't think of anything. I mean, I <laughs> I just thought it was so on point. It, it, I mean, it, it really is the message that we need to be hearing. So you kind of answered the question, but I want to ask you this. Um, there are some people who want to make the argument that Christians shouldn't politicize this issue. They need to stick to works of mercy, uh, like feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. And if they would do that, then the church would have a better reputation and a name. Um, but you know, you've, you've argued, I think, very convincingly that, you know, some of this is just right in the center of mainstream Christian ethics and morality. So, you know, we're allowed to believe what we believe and teach what we teach. I mean, we believe a dead guy came back from the dead. Um, people may think we're crazy for it, but, but we're allowed to believe <laughs> that. So, right. you know, some of these other beliefs may be out of step with the mainstream. But how would you answer those who say that Christians you know, shouldn't politicize this issue? Or are they even politicizing it? I mean, you made the argument mm-hmm. that maybe that's not going on, but I'd, I'd like to have you unpack that a little bit more for our listeners. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, several things. One, sex involves more than one person. So, and it's potent. It's the power of creation of another life form. You know, another human being happens as a result of the sex act. So when for us to opt out of as the church to opt out of speaking into sexuality is irresponsible because you are affecting other people's lives. Um, My choice to um, engage in homosexual sex is very likely damaging another person's body. Uh, So sorry, that's that's real. And, and so it's not just about me and getting my needs met or trying to meet my needs in a way that I want to meet them. I affect other people. And, and, you know, so, I mean, like we have, we have children being brought into the world that don't have uh, a mother and father and stuff because of um, people not following God's prescription for just for heterosexual uh, intercourse. So um, we, we also we're, we're talking, when you're talking about how, homosexuality, you're talking about identity. We've already spent time on that in the earlier part of this. Well, the church should understand identity better than anyone um, because we have we we know ourselves by looking at him and by we find ourselves in God if if we're finding ourselves for real. We're finding ourselves in him. And that's 
why people are opting for alternative lifestyles largely is because they are, I was, that was my story. I was looking for me in him. I didn't like this person, but that was a better looking specimen over there of masculinity. And I wanted him. Codependency is what I had going. And so for us to opt out of speaking about sexuality, we're not actually helping meet people's real needs. Like they have emotional and relational woundings that God has answers for. And if we opt out, we are leaving them in their pain, in their brokenness. Um, so, I, you know, I just think, I think it's not a good idea to opt out of this. We actually can do this better than has been, been done before. We can come with grace and compassion, pointing people to a loving father who has answers for their lives. Um, what, but, you know, I think some people want us to opt out or leave it alone because they've seen it done wrongly. They've seen people picketing or or something like that when, no, we can actually, you know, I, I, I like to talk about, I got this from my friend, Kathy Grace Duncan, who lived 11 years as a man, though she was born female. And then she's been out of that life now. She's lived as a woman for 30 years, knows Jesus better than just about anybody. And she she talks about, you know, when when there's the demand now for someone to, well, you, you need to use my new pronouns, right? If, if it's a, tra- a person living a trans life, boy, it's an opportunity not to have a fight with them over pronouns, but to say, my goodness, you know, I've, no- I've known you for six years and this has never come up before. I've always known you as Adam and not something else, you know, not the female this is a bit, let, let's put the po- pronouns over here. I need to know how you're doing and, and what's going on in your life. I care about you. I care about you beyond pronouns. Let, let's, let me actually serve you as the person uh, and care about you and the uniqueness of who you are um, and not get tripped up over something like that. And I think, I think that this requires an intimate connection between people. See, the church should be showing up for the individual like you do, Ken, in your ministry. It's like you take time with people and you get to know where they're coming from, where the pain is, and you bring God into it. And that's what the whole church needs to be doing one-on-one with people. Yeah. Amen. I totally agree with that. Couldn't, couldn't, could not agree with it more. Um, you know, you said something a couple minutes ago, uh, speaking of sex and the act of sex and, uh, you know, it's a procreative thing. So another human being comes into being from it. And as you were saying it, I thought maybe it's time for us church wide to reintroduce a conversation about the sacred nature of sex. I think for too long, we just ducked the issue altogether, but it really is sacred. Um, Mm -hmm. Angels apparently do not have the ability to reproduce, uh, but human beings do. And that seems to be part of what makes us in the image of God. We call it procreation, not creation, and, and aptly so. But there's something about the fact that we can reproduce um, and create more humans that is uniquely God-like. And therefore, it is a sacred moment when two human beings come together uh, unitively. And, yeah. and I, don't, I don't hear a lot of conversation about that in pulpits uh, mm-hmm. across America, or for that matter, in the Western world, when I travel in Western nations. Maybe we need to, maybe we need to re-engage with that. I, I believe that. And I think it'd be, it's good for us to look at why are we not willing to talk about that? You know, what is it we're believing that would prevent us from talking about something that God clearly celebrates and even articulates, you know, uh, very, I think, appropriately, uh, you know, and and beautifully, like you're talking about Song of Solomon and stuff like that, describing love and, and uh, you know, um, lovemaking and things like that. Like, if God can talk about it, why can't we? What is it we're believing that would keep us from doing that? And I, obviously, we've seen it done wrongly so much. I understand that there's hesitation there. But my goodness, I mean, I remember Ken being probably seven or eight years old, and I I think it was even maybe before I got saved, being at church 
and, and looking around at the different men and women, they're young couples and thinking, this must not be okay. Like the fact that I know that you're having sex now with each other because you're married, this must not be okay. Because if it was, I would have heard about it at church. <laughs> I remember, yeah. I remember thinking that, you know, <laughs> there's something shady. It's over in the dark. It's not talked about. There's something wrong with this. And in fact, God, you know, God doesn't have any problem talking about it. And, right. and it's such an intimate part of our lives. It's such, it's, it is so special, so sacred to not be able to talk about it appropriately makes it dark and it, it casts it in a light that I don't think God ever intended it to be in. It's a wonderful thing. And you know what? I mean, it, I think so many have probably even not gone toward God because they think God's a killjoy. He doesn't, you know, he, sex is, is something that is actually out here available right. to people outside of God. Like, no, the people who should have the richest sexual experience should be people that are in fellowship with God together. Yeah. Amen. I, I completely agree with you on that. There's a lot I could say, but I, I think I'll just, I'll let it. <laughs> Some things are better left for another episode or uh, sure. maybe a different format. Ken, we're about out of time. Um, you've said so much that's life-giving and hope-filled. Are there any last thoughts you want to share with our listeners to give them hope if they're in a struggle around their sexuality, which it may not even be in the LGBTQ uh, you know, uh, space. It might be somebody who's uh, addicted to lust heterosexually or yeah. porn or masturbation. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any words of hope or comfort you want to share? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this sounds extremely simple, but I found that I've been in church my whole life, reading the Bible, singing the worship songs, but not really stopping and realizing it's true. Like, like being able to take God at his word, like those promises that he's made, he meant it. And, you know, I, I started actually doing something as simple as listening to the words that I was singing during worship and, yeah. and, and realizing, oh, my goodness, these things I'm saying to you and about you are, are something I can stand on. They're true. And letting my heart feel the power of that truth that I was singing out of my mouth and, and the scripture that I would be reading, like, oh, my gosh, I can bank on this. Yeah. I can bank on the fact that if I will trust in the Lord and lean not on my own brain, my own understanding, but in all my ways to acknowledge him, that he will direct my path. You know, I started putting stock in that and it started to change my experience. I mean, it's called faith, you know, and that was an, that was an expression of me having genuine faith in God that I didn't even have to muster up. He gave me that. I just had to start even paying attention, you know, instead of trying to get my, my Christian points by reading the Bible or by showing up at church, I needed to stop and get present with the fact that there's a person behind all of this. Creator God was wanting to interact with me, direct me, father me, comfort me. All these things that for some of us that grew up in church is just familiar. No, this is life. This yeah. is like how you do your day. And, and that same guy that will help you do your day cares. I mean, he's, he knows your end and, and he knows the plans that he has for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in the future. So Lord, what is that? And, and, and so, you know, getting my, getting my hopes up that, okay, I don't know how you're going to do it. And I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I absolutely am promised righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and he came to set the captives free. And if I feel like a captive, there has to be more, you know, he, he, he's, he's, he's good. And so to get my hopes up, you know, if we seek him, we will find him if we seek him with all of our heart. So uh, that's something I can do. I'm like, okay, I am seeking him with all my heart. I'm going to put all my eggs into his basket and go his direction. I'm telling you, get your your hopes up i think is the message i'm trying to say get your hopes up expect that the lord is as good as he says he is and and repent for any place that you have 
held back. I mean, if you've got homosexuality in your back pocket in case, but pursuing the Lord doesn't work out for you, um, you got an idol back here that needs to be repented of. And so, you, you, you know, you just say, Lord, search my heart. Is there any way in me that's not, you know, that's not righteous? And you, you get with someone, pray with them, repent for those things, put your eggs all in God's basket and see where he'll take you. It's going to be, it's going to be pretty awesome. That, amen. What a great, what a great way to encourage all of us uh, as we close. Ken, why don't you, uh, why don't you pray us out and okay. uh, call it a wrap? All right. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you could have set up existence however you wanted, and you sent your own son to pay for every need, every sin, every place of unhealth in our lives. You, you, you had Jesus pay for it, and Jesus, you did so willingly, and then you gave us your Holy Spirit to walk with us and talk with us, counsel us moment to moment. What radical generosity, Father. I thank you for that, and I pray that every person watching this or, or listening to this, Lord, would have direct access to you, that they would know that this is not Ken's story or the other Ken's story. This is an invitation from an almighty God who has specific plans for each person listening and who weeps over what we weep over. So if it matters to, to you that's listening, you have to know that it matters to God and that he leads us from faith to faith, like new levels of faith. He, he's the one who delivers us from darkness. And we trust in the Lord and you will not be disappointed. That's the God we serve. So, Father, I pray that you would reach every person that's, that's listening and that you would put their feet on the path of life that you have for them. And I just love you, Jesus, and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, Ken, thanks so much for joining us. Um, like a lot of our guests, we definitely are going to want to have you back uh, for some more conversation. There's so much more to explore. But anyway, that's it for now. Grant, you have anything you want to say in closing? Again, so much I'd like to say and talk about. So we definitely need to have you back. Uh, Ken, it's just an amazing story and amazing to hear from you and just such a timely timely word. So thank you. And thank you, Ken, uh, Ken Fish, and uh, uh, for joining us as well. And, and for all of you that are tuning in, uh, thank you so much. We'll be right back here at this time next week with another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. We've recently updated the Orbis Ministries app with Ken's free teaching archive. You can click on the link in the description of this podcast to download today.